and uh, today it's my privilege to be sharing with you and talking around some, uh, some principles of, of governance and decision making uh, to help us in our work uh, as church councils. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, um, I'm a minister in the Uniting Church, I'm in placement on faculty at uh, Uniting College for Leadership and Theology. Uh, been there for a few years. Um, before that, I was in a congregation. Before that, I was in Melbourne. And, um, and before that, I was in sort of country Victoria, where I sort of grew up. So I've been back and forward between Melbourne and Adelaide uh, a fair bit. I have a wife, Priscilla, and several children. And all of the governance principles I'm going to share with you today uh, don't work in the home. Okay. <laughs> Being best practice... Yeah, just <laughs> I love that quote that Sharon had before about the raggedness, was that her word? The raggedness of, of family life and church family life. Well, we're going to in some ways try and avoid the raggedness. God blesses the raggedness. But uh, whereas Sharon this morning has spoken uh, so helpfully around uh, healthy church councils and uh, being able to work together as a healthy community, uh, I want to shift the focus a little bit and we want to talk about uh, being healthy and effective. Uh, what does it mean for us to be effective church councils, not just to get on well? Uh, if we're not killing each other, that's a good start, but it may not be all that God has called us to do uh, as a church council. So today we're going to talk about that, um, effect, being effective in our, as a church council around the decision making that we make together and, and the things that we do. The reason, um, uh, what I'm going to share with you, I have quite a lot of information and um, I want to make two things clear. One is I may not get through all the information, and, and that's fine. Uh, secondly, if you can't jot it all down as we're going, uh, that's fine as well. Jot down the things that, that, that in, inspire you or are particularly helpful, because that's good for your memory. But I'm more than happy to email out a PDF of the PowerPoint later on, and then you'll have all the wording just there. So you can just sort of sit back and relax and soak it in rather than feeling the need to, to, to record the Magna Carta or anything like that. The, the um, principles that I'm going to share with you are uh, ones that are drawn from broader governance contexts. Uh, I, I've got a particular passion and interest in governance, and uh, when uh, that, that has formed over many years in different ministry contexts, not just congregations, but out of a theological college. I've been on the board of two different theological colleges. Uh, I've been on the board of um, uh, Seymour College, so one of our Uniting Church schools, um, and I've been on the board of a small startup mission organisation uh, and then also of uh, several church councils in different congregations uh, and also in different denominations as well and been the chairperson and, and so forth. I'm also a minister, so I've been on that side of the fence or the equation uh, as well. Um, but I've also done some work uh, with a company called Capacity Builders, which is a consultancy company which consults with non-profits and Christian organisations on um, strategic planning and the future. So trying to help, particularly the work I've done with is with a whole bunch of organisations that have been around for a long time. So think about organisations like the Bible Society, uh, Youth for Christ, the Leprosy Mission. These have been around for uh, centuries um, and then many, many decades. And trying to help them to think through what does it mean for them to do effective governance and plan for the future uh, going into the future. So that's some of the, the work that I've done al also. Uh, and I've also done a, a course called the Company Directors Course with the Australian Institute of, of Company Directors, which is sort of like the industry standard for what you need to do to be a company director uh, in Australia. Now, I've done all those things uh, not because I'm so brilliant at them, but more because I'm quite curious about them. And I've wanted to find out because one of the things that I've noticed all the way through these, whether it's a congregation or a Christian organisation or a theological college uh, or indeed a company, um, is I've recognised that governance, I think, matters far more than we appreciate it matters. And in fact, governance can, can be a, a significant handbrake on a church or an organisation, uh, not because it's doing anything particularly wrong, but it's not fully appreciating the way it, it could be operating and the way it, it may maybe ought to operate. So when I bring some principles to you today, I, I want to bring some concepts and some principles, and there'll be in there a bit of language. And it won't necessarily all be uniting church, church council, familiar language. Okay, so I'm not starting from there and then saying, how can we make it work? I've thought, well, this could be helpful because you are all in your context and you know your church council. It might be helpful for me to give you some broader concepts and for you to be able to say, that one's helpful, that one not so much but I'm just going to give you the broader concepts and thinking about governance principles in general. 
And some of them we want to adapt for the church, and we can talk a bit about that uh, in, in our context. Uh, some of them we, we might want to take on holus bolus as being a really helpful new paradigm that we can work. Um, and another one we might want to leave by, by the side. Okay. Jesus encourages us to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, which uh, for me picks up something right off the bat. Uh, two things. One is it's an encouragement to be strategic, to be discerning, to not simply go with the flow, but actually to be a little bit wise and about the way we go about what we do. Don't just be a lemming as a member of a church council or as a church council, just doing what's in front of us or what we've always done, but to... You know, there's something around being uh, wise and, and being good stewards of, of our mission and our resources. Um, but it also speaks to our values. So it speaks to the, the, the quality of what we're doing, the integrity that we have, being innocent as doves. And in the, in the governance world, that's talked about in terms of ethics, being uh, a, a, having have a particular appreciation of being an ethical church council. And, and that's a lot of what Sharon has been talking about this morning, um, and I want to touch on that to some degree in the latter part of my presentation about how we make decisions more uh, helpfully and healthily, but I particularly want to talk about some ways in which we might be able to be wise. It's a real privilege and a real responsibility to be involved in governance, and, and, and particularly in church councils, I'd say. It's an honour, really, to be entrusted with helping oversee the direction and the health of a church community. Um, in 1 Timothy 1-2, Paul says this, he's talking to Timothy and he says, it's true that anyone who desires to be a church official desires something worthwhile. And that's really important. There is a little bit, even in a conversation over a cup of tea before, I picked up just with a conversation with someone, we were talking about standing committee last night and how, of course, it was a, a long meeting because standing committee uh, is always a long meeting. And so there's always a sense of, oh, gosh, you know, annoying standing committee or that thing, it always goes on so long. Um, another, you know, church council meeting, how horrible it is. But, friends, it's a profound privilege to be involved in governance. It's, it's an incredibly wonderful thing to be doing. Uh, it's the opportunity to serve the church in a way in which not everyone uh, is gifted or skilled to be able to serve or will choose or feel an affinity towards it. I've always found an affinity towards it. I love being involved in the life of the Synod. I love being involved in church council and different, serving in different ways um, because I'm able to see that this is a place where ministry happens as well. This is a really important context of ministry. And, and so many things uh, come from that. We, we sometimes like to think about uh, theology over here as being uh, theory in books. And then we think about the, the, the practical pastoral tasks of ministry. And then we think about the dishes and we think about the practical needs in the life of the church. And then we think about governance and, and church council and all that stuff over here. Friends, let me tell you that doing the dishes and being on church council is a theological exercise as well. A budget document is a theological document because it's a list of priorities. It's saying what we're choosing to do, what we're choosing to spend God's money on. So you can look at a budget document and, and friends, it'll make a profound statement because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. So it's important that we don't leave this to those who might be happen to, you know what I mean, take care of it as some kind of small administrative distraction. But that we sit squarely and embrace our role as a church council and have become literate, become uh, in, in financial documents and, and be able to say this is a way in which we can embrace our role uh, as a role of leadership and of service within the life of our church and our organisation. Uh, you're desiring something worthwhile. Secondly, or thirdly, or fourthly, I won't keep count, the church council exists to serve God by overseeing the building of the church. I'll come back to the word overseeing, because that's a, a bit of a careful word there. This is from the regs. This says, The church council shall give priority in its life to building up the congregation in faith and love, sustaining members in hope, leading the congregation to a fuller participation in Christ's mission in the world. It's worth stopping and thinking, is that what my church council does? 
I know some of you here are ministers, some of you are church council chairs, some of you are church council uh, members and maybe treasurers as well. So we're all different in the room, but it's worth thinking, the church council I'm involved in, are we leading our congregation to a fuller participation in Christ's mission in the world? The church council is the opportunity or governance is the location where we're able to think about the big picture, the main things. And one of the most important things that we do uh, as a, a church council or in governance is to be thinking about the big picture, the big perspective on what is it at the end of the day that we're actually on about. And I would say that um, this goes to something around the quality of our life and the way we relate to one another but at the end of the day, we exist to do this, to lead the congregation to a fuller participation in Christ's mission uh, in the world. So I want to think about what broader governance principles might help us in our church councils um, specifically. One of the first principles I, I want to introduce to you is that in the broader world of governance, there is a, a, a theory at work um, it's generally referred to as the carver and carver model of governance. And it generally makes this distinction, and maybe you've never thought about it before. It suggests that there is a distinction between the governance of an organisation and the management of an organisation. And the carver model suggests that these two should be very clearly delineated different worlds of responsibility. It goes something along the lines of, of this, that every organisation, and you might think about this as a company or an organisation, uh, it has um, the owners, people who own it. Now, in a company, those are the shareholders, the people that own the shares of the company, own the, pizzas, the pieces of the pizza in, in the pizza. So they're the ones that, that hold it together, they're the owners um, in a church, it's a little bit different, as you'll see, but the shareholders can't all, usually there are thousands of them, so they can't all direct the company, so they elect a board. And the board of directors uh, is there to uh, make their decisions about the future of the company on behalf of the owners uh, or the shareholders. But they don't actually run the company. This is the level of governance. They're there to do a particular task, and I'll get that in, into that in a moment. But they actually don't run the company. They delegate the running of the company to hired em employees. The most important of which is generally, you would call the CEO or the executive director. That person is a person who participates in the life of the board, but whose job it is to accountably go forward and do whatever needs to be done to run the organisation. And they do that through the hiring of em employees who, who actually do the work, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's your standard company uh, policy. It's very important in that particular model that there is a clear line between governance and management. What that means is that the people who are on the board are not involving themselves and fiddling in with the operational, the management operation of the company. In other words, it's inappropriate for a board member to go and find someone who works in this little department over here and give them a particular task to do. Does that make sense? So the CEO, let's say he hires a chief financial operator and that chief financial operator hires, hires two or three accountants. That means that ultimately that accountant over here, yes, is working for the board. But it's inappropriate for the board to get involved in the day-to-day -day operations of that accountant. You see, because you're going outside the chain. You're getting involved in management. And so if the board's sitting there saying, I really believe that the accountants uh, should be using this particular uh, computer to do their work, not this computer over here, uh, and they should be taking their lunch breaks at, at, at 12 o'clock rather than at 1 o'clock, very rightly, the CEO would say, 
I'm sorry. That's management. You've got to trust that I'm overseeing that. Okay? It's also highly inappropriate for this accountant to suddenly turn up at a board meeting and start making and voting on the direction of the company. That's inappropriate. That's right. So at the end of the day, the role of the CEO is a really important role because they move between the two worlds. They are the one who is held accountable by the board for the management. So it's very appropriate that the board would say to the CEO, um, why is the accounts department using these particular computers? That's a valid question for them to ask of the CEO. And the CEO might say, well, the reason I did that is because we got a good deal in this and the accountants feedback that it's working much better and they take their lunch breaks at 12 o'clock. It's, you know, it's done. And, and that's, a, that's the board saying, okay, thank you, CEO, for telling me why you did that. You're keeping the CEO accountable for the management, but you don't actually try and manage the company yourself. Do you see how they're really different worlds? And that's a really important um, principle. It can be summarised um, in a comment by one of the doyens of governance uh, in, in the governance world, uh, is to say governance is different from management. Management runs the enterprise. The governance body ensures that it is being run well and in the right direction. You see the difference? Ensures it is being run well and in the right direction is very different from trying to run it yourself. And much conflict will happen uh, in the life of standard companies um, when boards try and interfere in things that are management and it's very difficult for the CEO because they're trying to run the management. They fairly should be kept accountable for the way it's being managed and if, in fact, probably the most important decision a board will ever make is who will they hire as the CEO and when it's time to get rid of the CEO and get another one. Because that really is the only hiring and firing kind of job decision they will make. And so it's probably their most important decision. So there is a clear separation between governance and management and the CEO moves in between. I want to go into detail about um, how the governance and management work differently and how they can work best. But I want to ask straight off the bat, how does that fit with a congregational context, with a church council and a minister, let's say, or pastor, um, and then any employees, but let's say other ministry agents in the life of the church? Does it fit well or not so well? What's, what? What do you think about that? The conflict is that some of the people who are involved in government are actually involved in doing it. And so it messes up the separation. What's, what's an example of that? Well, say, say we've got um, the Secretary of the, of, um, of the Church Council and they're also the administrators. Okay. okay. Both things. So therefore, they're involved in both they're an employee in the sense of, of that, they might be a volunteer for the sort of, They're still doing the day to day stuff, making sure things happen, and at the same time they, they take part in the support of decision making. Yeah. Yeah. To use maybe an even more cute example, you'll have a person who sits on your church council uh, who, are, who also um, uh, you know, cleans the toilets on a Tuesday. Does that make sense? The reason this breaks down to some degree in our context is, is a couple of reasons. One is we don't hire employees <laughs> to do all the work of ministry. We believe that the, all the people of God are involved in the work of ministry. And we actually draw... Uh, those people are also the owners and shareholders of the organisation as well. So there's a, we have this funny loop going on whereby we actually have congregations, and we have a congregation you know, meeting, if you like, that you know, the congregation elects the church council, so that works in a way. They congregate, you can't have a congregation meeting once a month, so you elect a church council to be able to do that more specifically. That's fine. 
Um, and then there's a sense by which they, although really they have to bring it to the whole congregation, hire a minister, but they don't hire a minister to do all the ministry. They hire a minister um, who doesn't, uh, to, to enable the whole church to do ministry. They have a particular leadership role in it, there's no question. Uh, but some of the people that they're getting to do the ministry will include the people on the church council as well. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting tension there. And it's more of that covenanting relationship between the church council and the ministers. That's right. That's right. That's that's a beautiful point. It was going to be my next point. That the actual the, the minister doesn't work for the church council. Um, in in one sense, it's it's not actually absolutely answerable to the church council in, in anything like this. The minister is actually part of the church council. In that sense, they operate as part of the church council. If they are, if they are answerable in an accountability sense, uh, more directly in, in, in the traditional employment way, it is to the presbytery. That's where the councils of discipline are. That's where the placement is made and all those things. So there's a sense by which the church council doesn't hire and fire the minister to, to lead them <clears throat> or to make the ministry happen. They actually... Uh, they, 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 they welcome in, as, you know, there's a discernment process for them to come, but the minister joins the congregation uh, in it to lead its ministry, but it also joins the church council in a sense as well. So there is a blurring of the model that happens at that point. Uh, then what about when the minister doesn't want to listen to what the board says, the church council, and says, I'm only responsible to presbytery. You can't even tell me what the ministry should be in the Well, see, if, if they, there's a difference there because they don't, exist, they don't exist outside of the church council to lead the church. In other words, they, they, in a sense, they don't, they don't answer to the church council, but they also don't have authority in the congregation for its leadership aside or opposing to the, to the church council. They are part of the church council. So if there is a conflict between the minister and the church council, then by definition, it's conflict within the church council. And that's a really helpful way to think about it. So that there's not islands over here, the minister's over here. I mean, in reality, there might be tension and there's difficulty, but that's, you must always view it as being within the church council. You can't boot the minister off the church council. <laughs> they're there. In, in, yeah, so they're there as... as as part of it. Now, this is actually, in a funny way, a bit similar to what happens in, in some companies as well, where you'll have the, the director of the organisation who's also a full voting member of the board. And in fact, it's funny to think about this, but in the United States of America, it's more common for the president, sorry, put it another way, for the chairperson of the board to actually also be the CEO of the board. That's right. So we, know, we never see that in Australia. That doesn't happen in Australia. But the chairperson uh, of, the, of, of, of a company, of the, chair, of the board, will also be the, the, um, the CEO of the organisation as well. And those roles are, are much more closely aligned in America. Um, there's reasons for that. That's more the model of church governance that we see in the Pentecostal context. So in that sense, they will have, it'll be the first among equals, if you like, of the senior minister. So he'll be running the church, but also running the elders as well. And so there are benefits to that in terms, but they are investing more focus and authority into an individual than sits comfortably within the ethos of the uniting church. Yes. I'm, I'm not at all sure of what I'm asking at this point, but a lofty sort of question which you may answer anyway in the course of it, but what is the difference between a pastor and a CEO? And what, what sort of conflict is that, particularly for the minister to deal with? And also, perhaps for others in the church council, if they come home with some bright idea at work about that sort of model and willy-nilly try to force it on the church, so particularly between pastor and CEO. Yeah, well, so I'm using the language of CEO just to describe the model itself. We obviously don't see the minister as 
they don't take the title of, of CEO, and they don't really operate that way. The title CEO is a chief executive officer, which presumes that he's a person who's leading several other executive officers. In other words, it's a large organisation title um, that's, that's a helpful one for those large organisations. A congregation doesn't work that way, and, and also the role of the minister is also quite different simply from just um, being the manager who operates all, all, all the ministry that happens in the church. They have a leadership role in that, but it's, it's more to it than that. And I could, I could go into it, but... Um, yeah, but that's probably enough, enough said. I won't go into... But he's sort of leading the other members of the council rather than... or the people generally, I suppose, but... Uh, the, the, the way the Uniting Church would understand it is that the, the minister is, is giving leadership in the life of the congregation and is offering leadership within the context of the church council, not leading the church council. The chairperson is, is facilitating that. So th these are nuanced matters and it's very important. But the minister does have a leadership role within the life of the congregation, but we don't understand that as being somehow a final authority directive leadership. We understand that in terms of, of, of a, a servant leadership and a, a person who's a, a conductor, a facilitator, a, you know what I mean, a servant. But I think it's okay to use that word leadership. To, uh, one of the points that I'll make much further on in the presentation, if we get there, was, is, uh, <laughs> is, is to embrace the leadership role, I embrace the fact that, okay, we are here to offer some leadership. I think in the Uniting Church we can be a little bit too shy Part of the reason is that we, we have a, a, an understanding of consensus and we have an understanding of, of corporate decision-making and interrelated councils. That's a great strength in the Uniting Church. But it actually, consensus doesn't operate on its own. In other words, it can't, you can't just a consensus doesn't just emerge. It needs to be guided. It needs to be facilitated. Therefore, we have a moderator. It needs to be moderated. That's what happens. So we should embrace our role in, in, when you are in a position of leadership not shy from it, but not to be a dictator, but not to be an archbishop, but to say, well, come on here, we're here to, we're here to do something, let's get on and do it. And I'll get a little bit later on into some hints about how, how that can be. Um, can I ask you, in that model, where do you put the, the presbytery and the synod? Yep, so the presbytery and the synod um, are also, we would call, if you like, owners, stakeholders, shareholders in it. There's no question. So that's right. So the congregation, and this is again another point later on, never operates in isolation. And that's difficult for some church councils to, to, to understand. We can err one way or the other. Some church councils think, well, we need to check with all the other uniting churches before we make any decision about what we're going to do. And I would say, no, the presbytery would say to you, get on, lead, you know, discern God for your congregation and get on with it, you know, embrace it, do it, you know, buy that coffee machine, you know what I mean? Take that risk, do that thing, you know, whatever. <laughs> It would be sort of like, you know what I mean? Get on with it. Em embrace it. You, you have been, you are, the way the moderator, actually, um, when, when you come to a difficult decision, sometimes you can feel the, the synod or the presbytery or a church council wondering, oh, are we, are we allowed to make decisions? Like, this seems like a really big one. And sometimes as individuals, we find it hard to make big decisions that have consequences. And, and, and I've heard the moderator helpfully say, um, everyone, remember, we as a council, we are um, able to make this decision. In other words, you, you, you can't just not make a decision here. You need to embrace your role, accept the responsibility, and make the decision. You are able to do that. That's okay. So sometimes we can be a bit shy about, about stepping in and saying, yes, we're going to do it. But on the other hand as well, you also can't see yourself as a... Um, as a lone island. We are not the Baptist Union, where we're just a, a mere union of individual congregations who are self-determining. No, we have a broader extended family and we need to be keeping an eye to them and being aware of the context. You know, you know what I mean? We've got, and learning to, be, to, to keep an eye to the broader church and our place within the broader church um, without allowing it to simply fall into some kind of uh, uh, you know, paralysis is, is a skill and a nuance for a church council to, to appreciate. Uh, it's, it's okay for us to go this way. We appreciate diversity. Your congregation will be different to the one down the road. We hope it is because we hope your mission is what God's calling you to do. 
uh, and has not called us into some kind of you know, communist regime where we're all the same. Uh, okay? Okay, we're on the third slide. I think I have about 40, so we'll see. <laughs> uh, just a couple of comments to finish off this little bit. Um, I said the minister moves between these worlds of governance and management, but actually in the life of the congregation, in a sense, everyone moves between those worlds. Um, but let me make this point as well. Church council members obviously serve in the management sphere and, and should submit accordingly. What I mean by that word submit there is it's very helpful for us and very healthy for us to understand the different um, roles that we're taking on and, and, and do them in a Christ-like manner. Um, what's a good example of this? Uh, a person who is on the board, it's inappropriate for them to turn up and start telling the accountant when he should take his lunch and so forth. Um, but if, he, if they happen to have a, a volunteer day and members of the board decide to participate in that volunteer, let's say a clean-up day around the church or the office, I mean, you, you, you're obviously in a church going to be involved in the life of those things and, and you shouldn't go about that task as the church council member. You should go about that task as just a member of the congregation who's honoured and pleased to be getting their hands dirty and serving. Does that make sense? I'd encourage you as you go about whether it means you're serving on the band as part of the worship team or whether you are um, doing some helping and filing in the office during the week or whether you're rostered on to be on the cups of tea and so forth, don't approach those as if you're the church council member doing those things, as if somehow you, I want to say, you don't have authority in that context because you're a church council to start overriding what the church, the worship leader has planned for the day or to suddenly dictate where you're going to be on the roster for doing the cups of tea. No, no, well, the church, I'm taking this to church count. No, no, no. That's where our model of the separation between governance and management is helpful to us. Keep your church council, um, if you like, ears open all the time, but keep your church council mouth shut unless you're in church council. Does that make sense? If you've been given the job of being under, you know, little Johnny who, who helps with the clean-up and you've been given the job of raking the leaves, and, then guess what? Submit to little Johnny. That's, you're being a great church council member if you understand that he has authority over the cleaning up of the grass and your privilege is to serve him and you're serving God by serving him by doing the raking. That, that's, that's a helpful thing for us to appreciate. Sorry, someone... I, I, I fully agree with that. But quite often in a, in a, a church community, people who are in leadership will be continually asked, what should we do now? How should we do this? Yeah, and that, that's where that sort of continues to get um, fuzzy. That's, that's the long time. Yep, and so I think clarity in an organisation is, and in a church is, is important. Um, so that we have, a, a, and I'll come to this in a moment, a collective vision, not division. And, and I'll come to that in a moment, but a sense of, 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 of leadership and delegation and authority, if I can use that word, is appropriate for, for clarity and giving everyone an opportunity to serve with some sense of organisation. Paul talks about this in the New Testament, about the churches having, uh, not being chaotic, but having a sense of order about them. And, and that's where leadership is, is important. Well, I disagree to some extent with what you're saying because I think there's a lot of people who are just happy that the church council can fix it. Right. And the church council's mm. job is to involve them. But they really don't want to know. You know, I've been in the church for 70 years, I've done my bit, and I'm happy to just mm. sit back. Yep. Yeah. And if you could add one more sentence, so you would rather see... Oh, then I then I'd see the role of the church council as saying, there is something you can do that's in the Yep, okay. And it might be certain practices. Yes. It might be being friendly to somebody who's new. Yep. But there is something you can do. And your conclusions So I think it's important for the church council to decide, is it going to be only doing the governance matters... Or is it going to be the church council that's doing the governance matters and some management matters? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
part of the church council so, you know, visitors, there is the government, the vision setting, the leadership that is um, looking to where we're going and how we're going to get there. But there is also management parts that need the council to put its mind to Oh, it's always its job to ensure the management is happening, but different church councils, and I don't think in the Uniting Church there's any hard and fast rule. In fact, I think to some degree it'll matter on how large the congregation is as to how this works, but not, also I've seen other models at work. So I've been in the context of, of a congregation where there was a very, there's several, there's a, there's a minister, in fact there's a couple of ministers and some other staff um, and there was a very clear delineation between governance that happened at church council and management that happened during the week. And the minister would report within church council about how the management's going. But the management things, and what I mean by that is, you know, organisation of worship um, and, and the administrative tasks around the life of the church, uh, the, who's getting into small groups, the pastoral team, all of the operational aspects, they, they were all reported on how they're going to show that they're being done well by the minister in his report to the, to the church council. But the church council never sat down and said, okay, let's start rostering out the pastoral care or anything. They kept it right out of it. They just said, you know, you've got systems in place. Now, that was a larger congregation and that was appropriate. I've also noted that in many smaller congregations, you don't have much of a choice. The people that are, that are breathing and that are active and that are able to, uh, do you know what I mean? <laughs> are the ones are the ones who are on church council because they're the ones, you know what I mean, who've got the initiative and they're, they're making decisions and so forth, but they're also the person who's they're bringing the flowers that week and, and whatever. And so it may be appropriate, the, the, in other words, the minister, it may be just a resource minister, but it also might be a, a full-time minister or whatever, but they may say, you know what, uh, w this is obviously the core group of people that are active and energised and experienced in the life of the church, so we'll, we'll do the governance things. We make decisions about our future and strategy and all that stuff. But then we also talk about now, let's have a look at what's happening with the preaching over the next month. And that's just the reality. They both happen. They just have to. That just has to happen. What I've also seen, um, and, and so I think your point, and I think it's a helpful point, is for those congregations to um, be clear when they're doing one or the other. I think it's helpful for that to happen. So it doesn't fall, so when you're making a governance decision about how long, let's say the minister's extension of placement or something like that, that's a big governance decision. When it's a decision about um, you know, what, the, what, we, what the themes are we're going to preach through or the lectionary, are we going to follow the lectionary, those sorts of things, they're, they're the sorts of things that are management about who's going to preach when. If you start meshing them up, then it's a case of you preached a bad sermon, we're not going to extend your place. <laughs> do you know what I mean? They can't be. So you, you, need to, you need to make sure, okay, let's, it might be even helpful to say the first half of the meeting, we're going to deal with the big picture issues of where we're going, what God's doing, where he's calling us, our placement issues and so forth. Let's have a cup of tea. Now come back. Now we're dealing with the operational aspects. And I've seen a, quite a large congregation do that. A congregation, uh, I know this, of, of several hundred people who actually made a strategic decision that their church council would be made up of uh, the key leaders of the ministry groups and teams within the life of the church. So we've got a worship ministry team and that, that has a point person and then we have the pastoral care team and they have a point person and then we have this team. So the first half of the night would be that those folk come together as the church Sorry, no, it's, I think it was the other way around. The first half of the night, they met with all their teams on the same night. So the worship team came together and did their planning and the pastoral care team, the small group team, the outreach help team and the mission team. All these teams uh, met and had their meetings at different parts of the church and then come at 8 o'clock, uh, those meetings finished. Everyone had a cup of tea together and then at 20 past 8, uh, a key person from each of these teams came together and that was the church council. 
And so there's a sense by which those people are also able to report something of that, but they know they're putting on a different hat in, in that arena. And I thought that was a really creative way of making sure that there's a, you know, there's a separation and yet there's a, a conversation between the management of the church, the stuff we've got to do, and, and the governance. The other question is, the last one here is, um, where does the treasurer sit? Is the <laughs> on the money. <laughs> the treasurer, is the treasurer a governance role or a management role? What do you think? What's your experience in your, or maybe you're not happy enough to say, but from some experience, what? Both? Why is it both? Let me, let me, um, that's, I, I think that's helpful. Let me make a couple of observations. Many church councils uh, operate in a way whereby one person, the treasurer, takes care of the money. I mean, this is one of the oldest jokes about a church, is that the treasurer guards the money um, and the minister can't do ministry because they can never get any money out. And, the, and, the, and, and generally the guy's always been the treasurer and the church council will never overrule it because he knows, he's the only one that really knows what's going on in the books. You know, you know what I mean? There's a, there's a sort of a, a real conflict there. I think it's very important at the governance level. Sorry, let me make it the other way first. It's very important at the managerial level that you have someone who's doing the bookkeeping and making sure that, the, that, that this stuff's done. Someone has to count the money, someone has to bank the money, someone needs to make sure that pay slips happen, you know, all those sorts of things. That work needs to be done, and generally someone with good skills and ministry will do that stuff. Yeah, or, or, or a team, that's exactly right. That doesn't necessarily have to be the person who has the gifts and graces to then represent the financial situation to the board or to bring financial expertise to the church council. They may be a person who isn't on church council, but who, who prepares the budget and brings the financial situation and reports to church council, who resources the church council. But at the governance level, it's very important that the whole church council equally owns the authority over the treasury situation. The treasurer doesn't have more votes than anyone else. In fact, there's an argument to be said it's helpful to have um, financial expertise, someone who kind of knows how money works and plenty, in the life of the church council, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the person, uh, you know what I mean, who does the day-to-day -day bookkeeping. If it's a different person, that can be helpful because while you know it's all being soundly and accountably taken care of, when it comes to the decision making, which is what a budget is about, what we're going to do with the money, uh, you then have someone who's able to guide you in making prudent and, and good stewarding decisions, but you're not ruled by that particular person whose head is only in uh, that particular area of the church. You get the full expertise of what the Spirit is guiding us all to do in our mission. So I'd encourage you, I would encourage you that it's sometimes helpful not to not, not to have the person who does the books as the person on church council, but I would encourage you to always have person with financial expertise on church council. They can be the same person, but with that uh, is the need to, for the whole church council to be reminded, the minister in, included, that they all have the same ownership and authority. The money is God's and it's for all to steward, uh, not just uh, the treasurer, as good a job as they may do. Yes? Um, the size of the, um, of the congregation is a controlling factor here. If, you don't have, if you've got a very small um, congregation, 
you can't afford to have all these people doing all these different jobs. That's right. Sometimes you, sometimes you don't. You just have someone that's good. And I tell you, but I'm thinking of a particular congregation which has a wonderful... They've had a person who's been the treasurer for probably far longer than they should have been, for 20 or 30 years. And they've done that and they've guarded the money well. They've always made sure that there's always something there for a rainy day. They've got that expertise. And the congregation, for all intents and purposes, needs to wake up to the fact that it's raining. And the money for the rainy day, do you know what I mean? It's, it's now's the time. In other words, you know what I mean? We're not here to build a barn of money. We're here to build the church, build God's kingdom. That's what we're here to do. And so we should spend the money we have. We should spend it prudently, but it's there to be used. Um, and so we don't be wasteful, we be prudent, we be good stewards. But part of good steward doesn't mean you always save and never spend. Good steward says you prudently put your money into your mission that God has called you to do. If anybody's got too much, we'd want to. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. don't have people showing the money and the that they hide. Hide and hide, yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's right, Mara. Let me move into a different... I'm, I'm aware of how fast the time is moving and how um, little we've done, but I'll still send you the full notes and you can read them through at your leisure. The role and function of a board, then. This is, again, moving back to the broader principles and see how it works with you in a church council. Your job is to be an active trustee of the purpose of the organisation. Remember back to the comment just a minute ago, it's not about, uh, you're not there to lead the congregation to be the best congregation it can be, or the biggest congregation. You're there to lead the congregation to participate in the mission of Christ, which means you're there to serve not just the church, we're there to serve the purpose of the church, and there's a difference. Does that make sense? It can fit, when you've been in the church a long time and you're always doing the same thing and you're there and the building's there, you can feel like our job as a church council is to preserve this church. No way. That's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. Absolutely not. You're not there to idolise the church, the church building at all. You are there to be a custodian of the reason that church is there in the first place. You're there to ensure... That value is created in line with the purpose. Now, in a company, that means, you know, we're here to make sneakers and make money with sneakers. But for us, it's something different. We're looking for something, not just how much we can do, but we're going to create value. We want to oversee the performance of the organisation through strategy and policy. Remember, we don't want to draw, in other, we don't want to actually lead how can I say it, manage the organisation, but we want to oversee that it is a, always being done. So the church council is always taking, uh, they're always looking at the present, but they're also always looking at the medium and long-term future as well. And they're moving between those. They remember the past, so they're oriented and remember that they have a memory, but they're always the ones who are looking to the future. And sometimes the, the minister, if they're a good minister, can help you in that, guide you and lead you in, in looking at your context into the future. You're monitoring the performance. Now, performance, again, is a, is a corporate word, the performance of the church, but you could use another way. You could, you could talk about it in terms of its effectiveness or its health, those things, but just think about it in terms of fulfilling your mission, uh, monitoring that and ensuring that the performance is in the shareholder's interest. In other words, we're actually doing well in the ways we're called to do well. We might be doing really well financially, but that's only there to serve the purpose. It's not an end in itself. Uh, we might have built... The, remember that um, there was the, 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 the bishop um, in... Oh, where was he? In Southern America somewhere. And he'd spent $10 million on a new sort of palace, you know, bishopric kind of palace for himself in the Catholic Church. He said, well, he's, a one, he's got a magnificent vision for property. You know what I mean? Incredible performance in the property area. But the Pope got him on a flight back and, and de-bishoped him. <laughs> because, it, no, 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 you've totally missed it. It's not the building's there to serve the mission. The, the money's not there just for the building. Um, I love how our new pope, our new pope, the new pope does those sorts of things, isn't he? An exciting new pope. Uh, so uh, that we actually meet the objectives that we want to meet, that we comply with our legal requirement. Very important that we do that. Yes, it is hard. 
that we manage risk. In my experience, church councils um, can be actually too risk adverse. In other words, they, they don't have an appetite for risk. They actually don't want any risk. And I just can't read the New Testament and not think that we're not called to risk. You can't have faith if you don't have risk. You know, there's, the whole life is a risk. My goodness, I mean, there's a sense, we're called to have big, strong and courageous for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We're called into an appetite for risk, but not to risk that is foolishness, if you like. So we've got to, that's again, making that wise and prudent decision, but you need to have some faith. And then, of course, I mentioned before, their job is to recruit the CEO to manage the organisation, and we talked about how that is different. So here's a small little one that just gives you the same illustration again. Governance exists to, in order to translate the wishes of an organisation's owners into organisational performance. So to say that the, the, the church, the people of God, this is what God is calling us to do. And I want to add God into one of these owners as well, because it's his church, isn't it? <laughs> it's his church. So what are his wishes for the church? And how can we make them tangible and real and, and fulfil them? That's our job. The key role of the board or of the church council should be to ensure that the management is continuously and effectively striving for above average performance, taking account of risk. That's a pithy statement for a board to make and it may be helpful for a church council to think of it as well. Let's translate it. The key role of the church council is to ensure that the leadership of the congregation or the congregation its ministry is continually and effectively striving for above average effectiveness and health, uh, taking account of the risks. So there's a, there is a, you see, there is a leadership role in the church council. You're not just there as a custodian to ensure something lasts a century. You're there to, 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 to make sure that the, the, the glory of God is activated and present, that the people of God are activated. Are we doing what God's called us to do? If we're just still sitting where we were five years ago, well, the church council needs to own the responsibility of we've not done our job well enough. We, we, we need to do that. I'll jump over that because we talked about it before. Um, I'll men mention this very briefly. One is the conformance, another one is performance. Conformance is monitoring the terms of how well it runs the organisation in the interests of the community, the government and other relevant stakeholders in accordance with the law. And this one is setting objectives and working with management to improve the agency's deliveries against agreed objectives. So this one is kind of, are you a healthy and ethical organisation? This one is, are you an effective and, and growing organisation, if you like? So there's the health and, and then there's the, the, the effectiveness as well. And so the biggest key you want to think about then and the thing you need to grapple with as a church council is uh, what is performance? In other words, choose another word for it, but who are you? Why do you exist? What's your purpose? What are you actually wanting to do? This is the biggest question for a church council. What's God calling us to do? What is it? And that, that comes down, I'm almost out of time, but I'll jump forward to the, uh, noting this. Um, yeah, no, I'll jump forward and just jump straight into it. Your, your values, your mission, and, and your vision as an organisation. These are the key aspects that you need to be grappling with as, as a church council, with, in, including the minister. In fact, maybe guided by, by the minister. Let me give you this wonderful quote from C.S. Lewis. It's so easy to think that the church has a lot of different objects, education, buildings, mission, holding services, but the church exists for no other purpose but to draw people to Christ, to make them little Christs. If they're not doing that, then all the cathedrals and the clergy and the missions and the sermons, even the Bible itself, are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It's even doubtful whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. That we might be drawn into Christ and become like Christ. Uh, and so forth. So there's the big picture. I mean, you say, that's such a grand main... Well, that's right. That's the arena of the church council, to be thinking through what is it that God has called us. And that has three areas to it, your values, your mission, and your vision. 
And, um, and I'll conclude noting these three, three to you, unless you'd like some more points. Your values are the questions of what will you not compromise? We as a church, what will we not compromise on? Now, what you choose as those things will radically determine uh, what kind of church that you have. We will not compromise on hymns in worship. Well, that's going to lock you into a particular model uh, that will have consequences. We will not compromise on this building. We will not com- And so the, the role of the church council is to sit and think, hmm, this thing that we are debating here or this aspect, is it something we shouldn't compromise on that is directly related? You know, is it something that we really shouldn't compromise on or is it something that really is a, a little thing that we've made an idol to us? The question is, what will anchor the organisation? What will anchor the organisation? Uh, what is our foundation? And we might say, well, our foundation is Christ. Well, I think as a church council, you need to get more specific than that. And there's a sense by which you, you need to understand yourself um, theologically and culturally as well. The, 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 that's the arena of the church council, to be thinking through where you sit theologically or where you want to sit theologically and culturally. There's a sense by which sometimes we might decide to be theologically open and progressive. In other words, we want to be a place where a whole range of theological perspectives are welcomed and celebrated in our community. And I'd say, okay, if that's your decision, that's wonderful. But you also then need to ask a question culturally. Do you also then want to be a place where a whole range of cultures are present? Or do you simply want to be people who we get along with having all these wonderful diverse views? Does that make sense? Sit and think, okay, we want to have a whole range of theological perspectives, but who in our broader community isn't evident in our church? What age groups are not evident? What multicultural uh, representations are not evident? There's a sense by which we can strive for theological diversity and, and never even take off our blinkers and see that we have monocultural blinkers on. We never think through what it means for us to be diverse. Now, it may not be about just simply diversity for diversity's sake, because you probably can't minister to everyone, but then think through whom do you want to minister to? Uh, who, who is it? Now, you might be a church that says, no, we want to be more, this is our theological perspective. We want to have a theological perspective that's, that's listed by these particular creeds or this particular perspective on an issue. Now, that's okay if that's what you feel God's calling you to. The Uniting Church has the full spectrum. So if that's where you sit, this is where we stand theologically. Well, know that and embrace that. Uh, have robust reasons. Uh, don't use it as a weapon, but just know that it's there as a foundation of who you are. But again, still move to the question of culture. Where do we want to be culturally? We want to have a range of young people. Do we want to have a range? Do we feel a call to reach out to Sudanese people or not? Or, or, or to the Southeast Asian students or, or not? Or people in this particular neighbourhood or, or not? Or actually thinking that stuff through um, is really important a, a, as, a, as a community. Um, thinking about are we going to be a con- do we want to be a contemporary church and in what way? Those, those, sort, those are big questions. Your minister will be able to give, provide leadership and guidance and, and data on those things. But as a church council, you've got to wrestle and then make decisions around them and, and sit with them. Uh, things don't just automatically happen. Uh, often our values are defined by our activities, not just our ideals. And what I mean by that is a little bit like the comment I said before that Jesus gave us about where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Most of us think that it's the other way around. Most of us think that if we have our heart in the right place, well, then our treasure will just follow over. That's not true. We know human behavior isn't that way. Jesus is saying, no, 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 don't tell me what you say you believe in or what you say you value Show me where your treasure is. And I would say in the life of a church, it can be the same. We might say we have a heart for X, Y, and Z. And I want to say, show me the activity in the life of your church. What are you actually doing? If someone was to come down from space and look at the life of your church over a 24-hour period or two-week period, what would they see you actively doing? 
You say you believe in every member minister and yet I see this one person up the front all the time and everyone else sitting there the whole time. Don't tell me you believe in every member minister when it's these three busy people who seem to be doing everything and everyone else is sitting back and then the ministers run ragged. Uh, or whatever it happens to be. So when it comes to your values, you need to maybe look at your activities. We, always, we say we, don't, we value community, but we're never all together. Or we're, we're, we say we don't value meetings, but meetings are all we ever tend to do. Or we, we say we don't value the building, we value the poor, and yet we're, here we are, still sitting in it. You know? Or what, whatever, your activities are the sign of what you really value. And so you might want to identify in an honest conversation, what are our real values, let's be honest, and what are our ideal values. In other words, what do we want to have as our values? Two more slides and then I'm done. The second question is about your mission. And the mission is, what do you want to do? As a church, what do we want to do? We don't want to just do church. Church is there for a mission, for something bigger than that. What are we called to do? What's God calling us to do? And the good way to ask that question is, if we didn't exist... Why would God call us into existence? What task is there to be done? What needs to happen around this community that, you know what I mean? If we weren't here, some, a church would have to be planted here to do. And once you get, start to you fill a whiteboard and have ideas around those things, you're starting to say, okay, we're here to... And then, you know, somewhere in the midst of that is see people become followers of Jesus. But it's got to be bigger than that, see our community X, Y, and Z. One of the great missional questions for you to think through, mission questions, is to whom are we sent? We've sent missionaries all over the world for the last couple of centuries very effectively and in some cases quite clumsily. Let's imagine that you are in England at home base and you're being sent forth into your neighbourhood to be a missionary. Well, to whom are you, would you be sent? To whom would you see as being the people to whom you are sent to minister? That gets you close. That's a question for a church council to grapple with. Why are we here? And the last one is vision. The vision is, if you achieved this mission, if you actually started seeing happen the things you want to see happen and change around about you, uh, what would it look like? What will we see? What will look different? Answer this question. This is great for church councils to start and, and, and to fill up. A, the church that I see is, you know what I mean, in five years, in two years or whatever. They can be, and, and it's helpful to be detailed in these things. In other words, don't say, I see a church full of people. Well, that's great. Um, think more specifically. Full of which people? What types of people? Uh, and, and think how. What, what's the thing that's bringing them? And but think about, I see a church in the community that is doing this and that. Barbecues on Saturday afternoons, because this is happening. Uh, you know, meetings on church, uh, or whatever it is. Think of the church that I see. And then also ask the community that I see around about us. And that's again asking, this community will be different because our church is here. That's a church council question. And then maybe it's helpful to think that through in, in, a bit more theologically by asking from the Lord's Prayer, when we pray, should be, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. What the, would that look like in your neighbourhood? If, if you actually, let's say the kingdom fully came in your neighbourhood, what would be different tomorrow from today if the kingdom actually came? Well, the difference between it is today and the way you imagine it would be is your job. <laughs> What would Rundle Mall look like when the kingdom comes fully? I mean, just this is called having a prophetic imagination. Just let your imagination go wild on it and, and those things. So that's, that's the job. Now, I have a, many more slides around the roles of church council and then I have many more slides uh, around signs of a dysfunctional church council and then signs of a healthy church council. You've got them there as principles. Uh, I haven't obviously got time to get through them today. But if, if you would like to, well, I'll, I'll send it to Christine and I'm happy for her to distribute out to the email network if you've registered today. You can read through those and glean from them what you will. If you have a question, feel free to email me um, about the question or I'm sure someone else will be able to, to answer it. But I hope at least where we got up to was a little bit helpful conceptually. And uh, so God bless you for coming along and all the best. <laughs>
Pleasure.